all things value creation within startups and tech investing. Today, I am here with Jesse Randall, the founder and CEO of Sweater, uh, which is a fintech startup based out of Boulder, which is democratizing venture capital investing for retail investors. Sweater raised $12 million seed round recently, uh, led by, who was that, Jesse? Motivate VC Motivate and Acuna VC. Ventures. And Acuna Ventures. And you currently have a uh, pre-launch wait list of how many people? 58,000. Wow. All, most of them from LinkedIn, right? <laughs> I figure it's about a quarter of them from LinkedIn. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about how I butchered my intro like three times? Thank God it's going to be edited, but. <laughs> hey, you know what? We all got to start somewhere. <laughs> exactly. I, uh, this is my third podcast today, so I'm a little scrambled. Oh, yeah. Oh, dude, I've been there. Yeah, I did uh, about 30 of these, uh, but it was over the course of like four months. So after a while, it's like, oh, yeah, doing the conversation again and again, <laughs> you know, I mean, they're always unique stories. But, you know, like when you're sitting in your seat, it, it starts to grind. Like, I totally get it. No, exactly. And you're just then you're just like, OK, well, I mean, do, does anyone like this or am I just speaking into a vacuum? Right. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> uh, well, super exciting. You just closed a huge round. Yeah, no, we're stoked about it. I, I have nothing to complain about. We've got great partners. We've got the right amount of capital to go do what we need to do when we hit the market. Um, you know, we've got a good foundation of people that are interested in what we're doing. Team's growing. We, we like today, about half our team's remote, but we had a whole bunch of people come in today for special meetings. And then we were interviewing some people and there were like a dozen people in the office in our little teeny office right now. And it was like nowhere to sit. And like, you couldn't take calls because there was nowhere to go. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah. How big is your office now? Oh, geez. It's teeny. It's like 1200 square feet, but <laughs> we are outgrown. We're going to be moving offices, you know, so it's fun. You know, all the administrative side of the business. Exactly. All right. So why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and the business? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I got into venture about a decade ago. Um, I came out of grad school and ended up working for Tall Wave, which you know very well, and uh, kind of cut my teeth there inside what started out as an accelerator um, and kind of venture studio and built its way into a venture capital fund. So uh, at some point in there, they, you know, we, I helped create an official startup accelerator program and we flew in companies from all over the country. And I ran a few cohorts of that, which was a really foundational experience for me. You know, like it was the professional polish and execution of this program was really good for me to be on that side of the table, helping founders. Um, and then, you know, after that, I, I moved on and worked for some other venture back companies and ran, ran my own um, marketing agencies for a little while and then got into the idea of wanting to build a venture fund. And, um, you know, part of my like the way that I ran into Sweater was that I went I had these exploratory conversations at the beginning of this process to create a fund and was confronted with the reality that I couldn't invest in my own fund because I was not an accredited investor. And I always knew about the accreditation rules, but I'd never really been the one locked out of anything. And, and, it, and, it kind and of made... talk, you talk a little bit about what those are. Yeah. So, so to be accredited, um, you either have to have uh, made $200,000 a year as an individual for at least two years and be expecting to do it again, or 300000 as a couple, or have a million dollars or more of liquid assets outside the value of your home. So uh, about three or 4% of the U.S. population qualifies as accredited investors, about 13 million households. Um, and I was not inside that category. So it was when I was doing this that I realized I couldn't invest in my own fund, which had a, bu a bunch of other implications for the fund formation process and fundraising. Um, and it made me curious, you know, I was like, well, now I want to know like why this is really the law. And uh, part of my graduate work was in policy. And so I knew where to go to find out the history and how to examine it. And I didn't like the answer I found because it basically says, you know, the justification for it basically says, well, if you're not wealthy, then you're probably not smart enough to understand this really complicated stuff and we need to protect you from it. And yet you, yet me, you can just, go, you, yet you can go to Vegas. Yeah. But you can go to Vegas and blow all your money. You know I mean? It's just, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. And so to me, it was super condescending. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm not okay with that. And so I started going down this path of wanting to find a different fund structure that would allow regular people to be inside a vehicle that would invest into VC um, qualified companies on their behalf. And it took, I mean, I'm hitting my four-year anniversary working on this next month, so it's it's been a haul. Wow, 
That's, uh, that's an incredible story. And so why, what, what made you want to go from being a policy major at Thunderbird to working with early stage startups at Tallwave? Well, you know, that one was actually, <laughs> I kind of stumbled into Tallwave. It was kind of an accident. One of those things where I think someone else is controlling my life to like drop me somewhere <laughs> that I didn't know I was supposed to be. Um, so I actually went to Thunderbird and did um, entrepreneurial finance. And I did a dual degree with a Vermont law school in environmental and renewable energy policy with the idea that I was going to go into clean tech because about 12 years ago, there was this huge boom in clean tech and everything with uh, renewable energy and um, you know, sustainability and everything was a huge trend back then. And um, when I came out of school though, that whole industry hit a lull. I don't know if you remember um, oh, yeah, no, the, whole, a, the, the Solyndra a... scandal. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah, no, it was a huge, it was a big flare up and die down. And hopefully oh, we're was... seeing a reemergence of clean tech now, but. Oh yeah, yeah. Clean tech has been reborn as impact investing. <laughs> you know, it's like right. every other impact pitch I see is really like in renewable energy and sustainability and somewhere along those lines. But anyway, so I was planning on doing that, but that industry collapsed under my feet when I was coming out of grad school. Um, and uh, a T-Bird actually introduced me into the, t the folks at Tallwave. And I didn't, I'd never had exposure to software and really to startups on the professional services side of the table. And so that's kind of how I stumbled into it. I didn't mean to, um, but I, I loved my time in, at Tallwave and, you know, like the, the foundation it gave me was formational for my career. Yeah, you know, being able to uh, get that founder empathy and dialogue and talk track, I think, is super important and transmissible to what you're doing now. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't trade it for anything, you know. I mean, speaking of empathy, like one of the things I did right out of Tallwave that was also very formative for my where I'm at now and, and like what made it really possible for me to um, to have hung on a ledge for as long as I did to get sweater where it's at is that I came out of Tallwave and tried to do a startup. And um, I took about nine months to pursue it hardcore. And I made a bunch of mistakes along the way and ended up putting myself in a pretty bad financial position, frankly, if I'm being honest here. Um, <laughs> and ended up having to take a job uh, with a company kind of in an emergency kind of a way because I needed to feed my children. <laughs> and um, and I, I failed hardcore. Like I totally just tanked this idea. And looking back, I mean, the idea had plenty of merit, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I'm not accredited. My family doesn't have anybody that's really accredited that could have funded it. And I did all the wrong things in the wrong order as I tried to do this, which is ironic, given that I just spent two and a half years advising companies how to go through the process. And then <laughs> I myself totally tripped on my own shoelaces on the way out. But it taught me something really important. And that was that personal financial survival is the number one rule of entrepreneurship. You can't just like sit back and rely on savings to take you very far, unless you've no. got a lot of savings, right? You, you have to learn how to actually generate enough revenue or at least side income or something to support yourself so that you can see it through. Because if you don't have that, that at least base level of financial stability, then the chances of you hanging on long enough to actually see your company to a position where it can actually provide for you um, is really slim. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, uh, I, I cringe when I hear investors start beating up founders on you know, salaries, um, you know, I mean, within reason, of course, um, you know, it needs to be comparable to other founder salaries that are kind of out in market, which I'm seeing to be like, you know, between 125 to 175, you know, for earlier stage companies. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, I think that that's very reasonable. Right. And, you know, I mean, to, to get below that, I think is, sub, you know, especially in today's environment, you know, it's like, why do you want your founder stressed out about what he's going to feed his kids as opposed to stressing out about saving customers. Oh yeah, exactly. And that's just it. It's like, you know, you put a, a poor founder in a position where they're like, well, maybe I should take that little side gig that nobody knows about so that I can, you know, take my, like, let my kid play soccer this year. And then they're, they're totally distracted. And I've felt those feelings before. And yeah, you definitely don't want your founders in that position as they're building a company. So why did you want to be a venture capitalist? Let me let me let me re rephrase the question. Why in the hell would you want to be a venture capitalist? <laughs> I'm glad you rephrased it. That yeah. emphasis is good. <laughs> well, you know, I've always I've always really enjoyed being in the seat identifying ideas that work. So, have you ever done the, the strengths finder tests? 
Uh, I think so. I, yeah. they, they scare me, the results, so I just throw them away. <laughs> well, the results are so crazy accurate. It's, it is yeah. scary. <laughs> I know. So, I mean, so, so the whole notion of, of strengths finders, they've got, I think it's 32 or 33 strengths. You take their test. They tell you what your top five strengths are. The whole idea is you should focus on your strengths and make them, you know, 100 instead of trying to take a, you know, take them from 10 to 100 instead of taking a weakness and making it from a one to a 10, you know, kind of a thing. And um, I have these three strengths that are always my top three, and it's ideation, futuristic, and strategic. And the combination of those for me makes it really easy for me to be able to see down the line and understand the implications of emerging trends um, and things that, you know, like connecting the dots basically, and then seeing the reality of the path that would be required to make something happen. And I love that. I, I, I gain a lot of energy from um, trying to perceive what the future can hold. And so um, for me, that was my original you know, motivation was, hey, I would love to be able to work with founders and help identify and look, look down the road and be able to identify the trends and the founders that really do have a vision, and how it fits into the way that the world is changing and evolving around us. And that was my original motivation. Um, but after that, like after I had my experience that I mentioned, my, that was still the underlying foundation of why I, I, I'm passionate about this. But I got another layer of foundation on there, which is that I want everyone to be able to participate in this ecosystem. And that level of passion um, is just as great as my, my desire to want to be able to work in, with founders and see the future and help build and change the future. Awesome. It's a great, that's a great story and a great answer. And I, I completely relate to, to what you're saying about finding the core competencies that truly give you that emotional juice and mm -hmm. leaning into that. And I, I have not felt that in its entirety until I started my own firm, because I basically design what I do around what I like to do. And then I, mm -hmm. you know, try to outsource the rest of the stuff. And it's all about connections and, you know, creating really authentic relationships and you know putting people together to help level up the, the status quo yeah well I, t I totally agree with that and empathize with it you know i mean there's something about you know creating your own destiny that is addicting and it's not for everybody like some people like my wife she just wants to be told what to do you know she takes a job and she just she wants her outline she wants to show up she wants to do her thing every day and not have to think about that and you know other people are just wired differently and I, that's absolutely the way i'm wired so how how so is is sweater a venture fund is it a fintech company is it a tech company how how would you how would how would you describe it um was this 12 million like completely to capitalize the parent co or is this to invest into other companies yeah yeah excellent question so uh think of sweater as a fintech company that just happens to be operating an underlying venture fund think of it that way so we fall into the same category as like an Acorns or a Titan or um, a Cadre, right? That have technology fronts. They're aggregating community around the notion of an investment thesis of an underlying fund that actually deploys capital. In you know, there's a lot of different ways that all those companies work in the way that they deploy the capital. But for us, we are um, we are a technology company first. But we take our investment thesis, you know, very, very seriously, because we're only as good as the investments that we make, right? So when I talk about sweater, I kind of put it into two sides and like two side by side silos that are equal to each other. One side being the marketing machine, the technology, the community that we build, um, all the content that we produce and everything is on that side in order to bring members in the door that want to invest in to the fund or right. funds eventually. Um, and then the other half is the capital deployment. As that money comes in, you know, we've got to have our own pipelines. We've got to have our own connections uh, to vet companies and identify opportunities, make investments, take care of the companies after the fact. So that's like the two sides of the house. Uh, the technical way the company is set up is uh, Sweater Inc. is the fintech company. And the 12 million that we raised is at that level in an equity position, just like a VC would take a position in any other fintech company. None of that money is going towards capitalizing the fund. It's all for operations and technology and building out the team. Uh, underneath that is the Sweater Cashmere Fund, which is a totally separate entity. It's a statutory trust. It's set up in a very specific way as a registered investment company. And so when people come in through the app and make an investment, they're making an investment into that fund. And then that fund is operated internally by a, a group of our, you know, our team, our capital deployment team. And it makes investments into companies out of that fund. Now, is that uh, the Cashmere Fund? Um... You said that's a trust, so it's not a limited partnership. That's correct. Yeah, and that's part of the uh, legal requirements for how we're set up as a registered investment company, um, which has a totally different 
set of uh, operating requirements than a typical limited partnership for a, a venture fund. In which case you would have to be an accredited investor. So you really can't, you're, you're not, I mean, you're trying to break this model by taking another route through a, another regulatory structure. Yes. And so, I mean, the, I think the history is instructive here. So um, if you look back, uh, the, the reason accreditation requirements are here was because of what happened in the Great Depression and, and everything that happened uh, during that, that period of time. So the 1933 Securities Act came out after that, the crash in 1929. And a little bit later, the 1940 Investment Act, Investment Company Act came out. And those two laws govern every investment vehicle in the United States. It's like, I mean, it's for accredited, non-accredited, qualified investors. Every type of investment vehicle is, it's like an umbrella that touches everything. And over the course of time, what happened is that people would go to the SEC and they would want to create an investment vehicle for a specific purpose. And so they would work with the SEC and come up with specific legal operating parameters in order to invest in that asset class with those types of investors and whatever. And they're, they're kind of like a silo underneath that umbrella. And over the course of time, dozens of these have been created. So you recognize like REITs and mutual funds and ETFs and hedge funds. Like, you know, we recognize a lot of these names and there are dozens of them and many that, you know, you've never heard of before. So venture capital is one of those that was created, but it wasn't created until the 70s. And when that happened, basically, it was all of the super angels that invested in like Intel and Hewlett Packard in the 60s. They got together after a decade of winning and said, hey, let's pool our money. But when they went to pool their money, they had to deal with this big umbrella of regulatory oversight. And they're like, that sucks. Like, we don't want to do that, but like, we still want to make these investments. So they lobbied to have their own like set of parameters made. And those parameters are what turned out to be accredited, excuse me, the, the venture capital uh, legal stack today, which basically the, the SEC said, okay, yeah, you know what? You guys can pool your money with less regulatory oversight. Less that's, that's, the reg, that's reg D, right? Yeah, this is reg D. Yeah. yeah. You know, less oversight, but in, in exchange, you can only take money from accredited or qualified investors and you could only have 99 people in a fund, people or entities in a fund. And that's generally what venture, how venture was born. And it's been the same since 1972 or whenever they created the first fund. So coming back like to where we're at, everybody looks at that reg D stack and says, Hey, how do we like find a loophole in that? And we stepped away from it and said, Hey, you know, we know there are dozens of other fund structures instead of trying to change Reg D, what if there's another fund structure that would allow us to take money from retail investors and invest like a venture capital fund in the same assets, but just have different operating requirements? And that's ultimately what we did. So we fall under the, like a registered investment company. It's basically like, we're more like a, a cousin to a mutual fund than we are a cousin to a venture fund from an operational requirements perspective. So, yeah, so why hasn't this been done? You would think everyone would wanna have access to retail money. <laughs> well, after having gone through this for the last four years, my friend, I can tell you why it has not been done. <laughs> it is, <laughs> man, it's like it's like the difference between running a private company and running a public company. Like the, the amount of oversight requirements that we have um, in order to take money from retail investors is enormous. We have to price the fund on a daily basis. We're audited every single year on every investment that we make. You know, we have to track every penny that moves everywhere all the time. Um, we're held to a very strict standard when it comes to valuations and all this other stuff. It, it's a total pain in the neck. There's a reason that, that nobody wants to do this. Right. And when it, it's not worth you know, it. And you, yeah. And, and you look at Reg D, you know, and, and the way the VC funds are set up, you know, you look at Andreessen and people are like, well, Andreessen will just go do this. I'm like, no, they're not. Are you kidding? They've got a, a line a mile out the door for yeah, 50 would million dollar checks that they don't want money from retail. You know, that's a pain in the neck. They'd rather manage a hundred or even 500, um, uh, very sophisticated, accredited, and qualified investors than they would a hundred thousand or a million retail investors. They don't want to do that. No. So there's plenty of reasons. But you know, but I mean, to just kind of put a cap on that, there are other reasons too. I mean, not just the the management of it, but ten years ago, it wasn't possible to go direct to retail. It was too expensive. There were there weren't channels that were established enough to even make that acquisition cost uh, doable. The the ability to educate and be transparent through technology also wasn't really available, right? And then the regulatory climate wasn't really available for that either. Even though this fund structure that we're using um, has been around for decades, the, you know, convincing the SEC that it was okay to invest in this asset class with this lack of liquidity that we're facing, 
may have had more headwinds 10 years ago that it wouldn't have been possible even if we had known about it and had the desire to do it. So a lot of stuff came together that makes the timing for this right now just really special. That's, uh, that's super cool. So there are other types of formations that also offer um, opportunities for non-accredited investors, you know, such as, you know, crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. So how is this different? Yeah. So equity crowdfunding um, is great. I mean, like we, we're very grateful that it's available for founders. So many companies can go raise money now that um, otherwise would have been left between this vast gap between venture capital financing, which has very specific requirements for companies that qualify for that and traditional banking. Because banks are just so conservative, you know, like if you don't have operating revenue and tons of collateral, you can't get anything from a bank. No. So if you fall in between, you're kind of screwed. So equity crowdfunding helps to fill that gap. And I'm grateful that it's there. But when you go to these equity crowdfunding portals, you know, like Republic or, or Seed Invest or Start Engine and these, um, typically the companies that are listed there could not go and raise venture capital dollars for the most part. Um, they don't qualify for it. You know, so like you look at a brewery, right? Or you look like at a, at a single product company or something like that. Like they just don't qualify for venture capital funding. So they fit in this box really nicely with equity crowdfunding, but that's not where Sweater fits. So Sweater, as we invest, we're a VC fund. We will only invest in venture qualified companies where a, an equity crowdfunding portal, you can only invest in companies that are actually listed there as a consumer. Um, with Sweater, we're not constricted to anything. We can invest in any company if we can get in the deal, right? We're playing a different game on that side. And on top of that, like um, there's really some difficult things as a consumer inside equity crowdfunding portals where, um, you know, it's kind of common knowledge now that if you want to be an angel investor and make direct investments, you need to make at least 30 investments so that you have a broad enough portfolio that you can actually get your money back. And most people going into equity crowdfunding portals will not invest in more than a handful of companies, which means the likelihood of losing all their money is super high. Um, and on top of that, they're investing in companies that are typically not venture qualified, which is an even different type of risk profile. So when, when someone invests in Sweater, you're investing into a professionally managed fund um, that has uh, venture qualified deal flow that only invests in venture qualified deal flow that creates a portfolio for you. And it does all the reporting back through the app and takes care of everything so that it's very hands off for you as a consumer. So we just kind of we're positioned differently and we're grateful that equity crowdfunding is out there, but we are fundamentally different. Yeah, they paid the ways for sure. Um, so when, when building this, you could, your cashmere sweater fund or sweater trust is, you know, limited to a hundred LP. So do you just see yourself replicating, you know, like, you know, like one sw uh, sweat trust is going to be for a hundred investors. And then you just keep opening up new, new, the more of them, more of them come down the pipe. Oh, we're actually not, uh, there's no limitation on how many uh, investors we can have in the cashmere fund. So traditional VC funds are typically limited to 99, but Got we're it. not. Okay. So we, we, we could have 5 million people in this fund. You know, it's, it's, uh, th and this is where it's more like a cousin to a mutual fund. There's really not limitations there. So we can take from non-accredited, accredited, qualified, minimum check size is $500, or you could put in 50 million. You know, we could take anything. Okay, great. And so, um, when you think about that, is this an evergreen fund? Yeah, it is effectively evergreen. Okay, so basically there's no there's no end of the cycle. People put their money in and they can pull their money out. Yeah, and there's some parameters to that. And that's where you know our fund structure, it's uh, specifically, it's called an interval fund. And the interval part of that name refers to liquidity intervals that we open up every six months. So like um, inside a mutual fund, you can take your money in and out whenever you want because they're dealing with liquid markets. But for us, like the interval fund structure is built for private assets. So every six months, we open up a redemption window where you can request a portion or even all of your position out of the fund. And we have some safety parameters that help protect a run on the bank and some other stuff that we manage. Um, but, you know, that's what kind of the dynamic. But part of also what having an evergreen structure does is it allows us also to have people to create some unique features that don't really exist. Uh, I mean, kind of exist, I guess, today in venture, which is that people can create a subscription and sign up to put in $100 a month and continue to grow their position. And they're just always buying into the fund at whatever the current uh, NAV price is for the fund itself. So that uh, recurring subscription component is super powerful for us because it allows us to um, have a very predictable income stream or investable uh, dollar stream coming in the door that we can then project into the future and know what's coming. 
So it's different than a traditional fund that goes out and, you know, you raise all your money, you get all your commitments, you sign everybody up, and then you have three years to deploy that money and you're doing capital calls along the way. Ours is different because when you invest, your money's going in and we have more of a real-time deployment mechanism where we're tracking what's coming in. And then within a certain amount of time, we are deploying the capital on a kind of a three to four month trailing basis behind money that's coming in. So it changes the dynamics of how we think about portfolio theory and everything else. Yeah. So let's say I want to put in 2000 bucks, right? So would that take 2000 bucks and split it up into, you know, X amount of months and spread it out? Or is it only if you want to do that? No, it's only if you want to, you can drop money in up front, you know, or you could come in and say, I want to put in a hundred bucks a month for 20 months. It's really up to you. Um, but, you know, as part of that, you know, I think that the the nature and flexibility of it is really appealing to a lot of people. I mean, we, we've had, like, we were surprised as we started putting the message out in the market, we originally created this for, you know, the entry level investor, you know, the, uh, someone doesn't have a lot of money and wants to put in $500 or maybe $2,500. But as we got the message out there, we got this very strong feedback from the accredited investor community, actually, who, you know, they have enough money to go invest in startups on their own, but they don't have the time or the expertise or the desire to go create their own portfolio. Um, and they don't, they can't quite write big enough checks to write the quarter million or half a million dollar checks to get into a venture fund. And so they're kind of stuck in this spot. And, um, so and we have doctors coming to us saying, Hey, I want to drop in a hundred thousand dollars and sign up for 2,500 bucks a month. And it's, we're like, okay, yeah, that's not what we were building this for, but Hey, that works great. And, you know, we're excited that you're excited about this. So the, the, the breadth of interest that we have has been super fascinating. Okay, so we we talked a little bit about the the positioning of sweater in the market, where it kind of sits within all of these capital providers in early stage startups. You're creating a category. What on the deal sourcing side and the investment thesis side, like how are you thinking about that? And from a stage, a vertical, a type of business, mm -hmm. what's the what's the what's the methodology there? Oh yeah, this is where it gets fun. So this, this is the uh, part of the business I geek out on a lot <laughs> because I love portfolio theory. I love thinking about this stuff. So let's, let's split it into two parts of the conversation. Let's talk about thesis and then let's talk about like deal flow. So the thesis uh, from our perspective uh, is, is effectively because we're an evergreen fund, we get to operate a little differently. So instead of being constrained to making, you know, 30 or 40 investments over the course of a fund, like most funds do, uh, because it's evergreen, we could make hundreds of investments out of a single fund or even thousands, depending on how long we want it to live, which changes the nature of how you think about power laws and all kinds of other stuff. Um, you know, it kind of puts us more in a category like uh, Techstars or Y Combinator from a portfolio, large portfolio theory perspective. So because of that, it allows us to write checks in a different way. So we can write checks into in three big categories. So the front end is uh, really early stage, making direct checks, investments from pre-seed through series B, writing checks from a quarter million to 12 to 15 million on the upper end, actually participating in live deals. The next group is participating in secondaries, which is the late stage pre-IPO strategy, um, anything series C up to pre-IPO. And we, so that's participating and taking shares off the table for founders, or early employees, or buying out investors that have had a long exposure window or what have you and participating there. We don't have any limitations on how many secondaries we can purchase. We could do the whole fund in secondaries if we wanted to. And then we can allocate a portion into other VC funds, which our focus will be in emerging managers. Um, so from a thesis perspective, like at the highest level, um, you know, of course we draw a line of being venture qualified and having to make it over that hurdle. Um, but then other than that, we, the general theme on this first fund uh, is what we call consumer touching. So it's anything that a regular person might encounter in their life, either at home or at work. So this could be direct consumer products, could be apps on your phone, but it could also be B2B stuff like Slack or Gusto that powers your payroll or whatever the case may be. As long as a meaningful portion of our investor, our retail investor base could have exposure to it, then it fits our thesis. Um, so that's kind of like the, the overall thesis and how we think about that side. Um, from a pipeline perspective, we have a few different strategies that we are pursuing. So one of them is we've, we've got about 25 VCs that we have handshakes with to share deal flow. Um, and to have that back and forth relationship where we can benefit one another when we find deals that qualify for you know, each other's thesis. Uh, we'll continue to grow that. We'll probably be pushing 75 to 100 by the end of 2022 inside that group. Um, we've also got uh, what is effectively an outbound strategy and an inbound strategy. So the outbound strategy is we've got 150 scouts across the country right now 
uh, spread across about 12 metros that are actively hunting for deals. And these are regular folks that we're teaching like how to go and look for opportunities. Because one of our beliefs too is that, you know, founders um, are connected to lots of regular people, right? Everybody's got that that former roommate or, you know, that, um, you know, the colleague they used to work with or that cousin that's building a company. And you probably know about that before a lot of other people do. And so uh, these scouts that we have will uh, kind of be like our ear to the ground in all these local markets. And we'll continue to grow that group as well. So the objective there is to always have 1% of our member base be scouts. So when we've got 100,000 members, I want 1,000 scouts spread across the country. And then the, the last area is, um, it's really an inbound strategy. So as a consumer facing FinTech, we are marketing like crazy. We're gonna spend millions of dollars a year on marketing. And because of that, like VC, just generally speaking, doesn't market very much. Like, you know, you may do a podcast like this, uh, someone may be super active on Twitter, someone may have a blog, but from a traditional advertising perspective, that just doesn't really happen inside this world. And we're gonna be doing that. So we've already created marketing materials to actually go out and do paid advertising to be in front of founders, to bring them in the door on their own as well. So we're going to be very proactive, I guess is probably the right word uh, in terms of pulling deal flow in and, and finding opportunities to invest. So what are you telling your LPs the target return is going to be? Oh, no, that's a sticky subject. <laughs> so as a, yeah. a registered investment <laughs> company, we, we have to be very, um, what's the right word? Um, precise with the language that we use. How about that? So we can't sure. make promises in terms of like what we are targeting, but we can talk about the industry all day long. So, you know, I mean, of course, our objective is to be a 75th to 95th percentile performing fund. You know, I don't expect to, to crack into that upper 90th, 95th percentile level. Um, even getting 90, 90th percentile plus is extraordinarily difficult, but we're definitely aiming for that 75th to 90th percentile range. You know, and if you if you fall inside that category in the last five years, you're looking at an IRR of, you know, somewhere between 15 and 25 percent is what the industry typically does in there. Um, you know, some other stuff we can talk about is 50 percent of VC funds outperform public markets. And that's obviously going to be an objective is to beat public market returns. Um, so there's things we can talk about like that in terms of industry benchmarking, but we can't provide any parameters. Yeah. OK. And and. Um you feel like that's going to resonate well with the retail community? Yeah, so far we've been getting a great response for that. You know, I mean, there's always- Right, because at a mutual fund, that... they don't tell you what they're going to earn because you're, you can't time the market, right? You can't say what the market's going to do. Yeah, exactly. It's the same concept. We're held to the same messaging regulations as a mutual fund. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, so if I'm, I'm betting on an ETF or I'm betting off a mutual fund, they're not going to say that I'm going to make an, a certain IRR. I get the, the benefit of a managed fund that has diligence, diversified portfolio. Exactly. And may have a very specific, you know, sub-segment of the market that you believe in, right? And so, and that, that's an interesting thing to just look forward in Sweater's life cycle a little bit. We're starting with one fund, which is the Sweater Cashmere Fund. But eventually we'll spin up other funds that are more themed, right? So that you can have that, that clean tech fund, you can have that international fund, a late stage fund, you have a venture debt fund, you know, and eventually uh, our member base will be able to allocate their dollars into the specific subcategories that they're most passionate about. So knowing that earlier stage companies take longer to mature and get liquidity, how do you foresee people taking redemptions and holding cash balances? Yeah. And that's part of the expectation that we are setting with people. You know, I mean, this is a long-term hold, right? This is right. not your crypto account. This is not your brokerage account. Like if you're putting money into sweater, expect it to be in here for a long time because it takes a long time to build and grow companies. And so we, we have a lot of messaging around in the signup workflows and in our educational materials that emphasize that again and again and again. We also have messaging, you know, along the lines of, you know, don't invest what you can't afford to lose, right? Because this is still a risky asset. Uh, despite it, there being a portfolio and diversification, everything else, like you, you could lose everything. And so um, the expectation that we're setting is that they should hold on to it for a long time, but that these redemption windows are built in for emergency purposes. So if you need to access your money, uh, you know, like uh, your grandmother passes away and you need 10 grand to pay for a funeral, um, we want them to be able to access their money in a reasonable amount of time. So they couldn't go in tomorrow and say, hey, I need to take out all my money but they can look forward to the next redemption window and they can make a request and be in line to be able to get that portion out if they needed to. But otherwise, I mean, the general theme is you should 
put in what you can afford to and what is a risk adjusted profile for the rest of your investments. And you should plan on leaving it there or even growing it over time for a long time to come. Um, you know, so when there's actually liquidity events inside the portfolio and one of the companies, you know, grows and IPOs and that money comes back to the fund. At that point, each individual investor will have the opportunity to decide if they want to recycle that money back into their uh, account or if they want to take it out. And that's how they'll harvest out, just like an LP in a regular fund would. Yeah, I was always in the beginning of the podcast, I was thinking a lot about the technology that you're building and, you know, what was the application of it. Now I kind of understand it's tons of eternal workflows. So many workflows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, I mean, and that's just, that's just it. It's like the technology component is what enables us to do all of this at scale with so many people. I mean, our objective is to have millions of users 10 years from now, you know, and you can't take care of millions of people like that without really good tech. So when, when is this thing gonna, when's this thing gonna launch? When, when do you, do you have a, do you have a date or is there, is there a clearance you're waiting for? Or what, what's the, what's the story? What do I say? I, I say we're, we're closer every day, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, no promises on dates, but we, we strongly expect to launch in the first half of Q2, um, you know, launch for oh, us as awesome. a multi-phase approach. That's yeah, we're awesome. very close. Yeah, yeah. We just turned in um, the final, what we expect to be the final version of the prospectus to the SEC for its final stamp of approval about 10 days ago. So we expect to be getting it back here very soon. And then we'll go through a private beta stage that's about three or four weeks long. Um, and then we have a waitlist conversion stage where everyone that's on the waitlist will have an opportunity to sign up before everybody else. And then we'll launch publicly after that. And then what about on the on the, the deal side? In terms of like deploying capital? Yeah. So do you have like deals waiting to receive or do you just have your detail, your your team waiting? Like how are they, how are they, you know, managing the kind of supply and demand? Yeah, that's been a fun game to play. Um, so I mentioned earlier, we've got those 150 or so scouts. So we've looked at about 250 opportunities in the last three or four months. Um, and the deal quality is actually really great so far. Espe I mean, especially given the fact that we don't have any money to deploy. People, founders still talk to us. They believe in our mission. They ask if, you know, like they, they continue to come back and ask when we are going to be investing as they're going through their fundraising cycles so they can allocate to us. So that's been very positive. Um, I'd say out of 250, you know, we probably have about 75 that are like really top class, very good opportunities. Um, but of course, like we still have to go through final due diligence and all this stuff. So um, we have plenty of opportunities that are waiting. And it's been a game, you know, to kind of set expectations and get to know founders and respect their time while adding value where we can as we wait to deploy capital. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, like the first dozen or so investments that we make are going to be our most important ones. We expect to do a bunch of secondaries. And so we've been, um, courting a lot of really amazing founders who are well-established in market and names that people would recognize that we would love to do secondaries with, but there's a lot of timing associated with that. I mean, you know, the game, yeah. it's yeah. No, nothing's ever set. You can't put a date on the calendar. It, it's all opportunistic and you just kind of have to roll with it. So, yeah, no deals. I, one thing I've learned about deal flow is that, you know, you can try to, you know, sequence it as much as you want, but you never know when you could have three things on your plate and then you could have nothing. <laughs> Oh, it's yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah. Feast or famine, as they say, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Well, that's anything in the kind of transactional business. Right. So talk about um, the kind of consumer facing brands, products, um, apps, and why that resonates within the sweater platform. Well, out of the gates, you know, I mean, especially for the first fund, our real deep objective was to make sure that our member base could feel an emotional connection to the companies that we're investing in because you know that <clears throat> what we what we've discovered from people is that yes people are excited to get into a new asset class that they've been locked out of right and to make money in a new way that's that's definitely an exciting component of this but we've discovered this whole other component which is really kind of driven by by status and storytelling and being able to project their personal brand and wrap it into the venture world and startups, you know, and be associated with it. And so, you know, half of the purpose of the app is to provide storytelling and insights and give you something to brag about at the bar on the weekend with your friends, you know? And so there's this unique dynamic around, um, you know, consumer facing companies being a great investment while also having great stories to tell that our investor base can actually relate to and are excited to talk to people about. 
So we're playing this, you know, this balancing act of getting into great companies while also um, producing a lot of great content. So like we have this whole internal branch of the company that we call Sweater Media. And all it's going to do is crank out content all day long. And that content's going to live in the app. It's going to live across our social channels. And it's going to provide our member base with the ability to have stories to tell. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of components around it. I mean, besides the storytelling component and the relational emotional component, there are great companies to invest in. You know, we went through PitchBook um, and they list out, I think it's 57 individual industry verticals um, when you examine them. You know, everything from FinTech to FemTech to PropTech <laughs> to SaaS to whatever, right? I mean, they list about 57 of those. And under our consumer touching definition, 43 of the 57 qualify underneath consumer touching. So, you know, for us, it, it gives it plenty of opportunity. Very, yeah, lots of opportunity um, and to be able to move quickly, too, because like here's the other thing, like in the first year, we're going to make 50 to 70 investments in one year because we have to deploy the capital at the same rate that it's coming in. And so we have a very different machine that we have to operate, uh, which is another reason we want a broad funnel as we get going. Yeah. And then how do you how do you think about underwriting deals, diligence? Um, are you following? Are you leading? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, well, we're underwriting every deal, right? We got to do due diligence on every single one. We're held accountable to it. We need to justify our positions. We need to have everything well documented, just like any other venture fund, if anything, even more so than the traditional venture fund. So, um, you know, in terms of leading deals, uh, we'll definitely be willing to lead deals, but it's not what the premise of what we're built on. Um, part of the VC partnership network is that we also want to go into deals with VCs that we trust and that we trust their diligence. We trust their ability to sit on someone else's board. Um, you know, we want to add value in a different way, uh, kind of like one of the ways just fundamentally that we think about our involvement with founders is that you take the typical GP and you know the story, right? The typical GP, you know, you are um, you're hunting for good opportunities. You're conducting due diligence. You are raising your next fund. You're sitting on boards. You're doing public events. You're doing your own marketing. You're being active on Twitter. You're doing all this stuff. Right. And it makes it very difficult to prioritize or commit a lot of time or mind share to any one of those, especially once you have 15 or 20 portfolio companies. And so the way we're looking at it is like, okay, well, we're going to have 500 portfolio companies. Obviously, you know, we, we, I can't do all that and neither can my co-founders. And so what we're basically doing is taking that stack of things and turning it sideways and creating every one of those uh, dynamics into specialists un underneath the sweater umbrella or uh, underneath our, whatever, our rug, our, our, <laughs> what, what goes with this? I'll, I'll, I'll give up on that. But like all of these are going to be specialty areas. So like take the example of sitting on a board. Um, we are going to actually have specialists who are more like customer success reps. And all they do is they just take care of founders in our portfolio all day long. And they have 15 founders. And all they do is that there's their beck and call for anything they ever need. They help them tap into our network. They, you know, help them make meaningful connections. They do all this stuff. And try to stay out of their way. Um, so like we, we would love to take board observer seats and be involved in the process and be helpful, but without being in the way. And we have some fundamental stuff about, you know, like, I mean, from our perspective, um, I don't really want the control factors um, because we're investing in, in the belief of the upside of the company. And while we want, you know, downside protection where it's reasonable and industry standard, um, you know, we're bigger believers in making the upside bigger as much as possible rather than, um, I guess, protecting the downside and trying to eke out a few bucks if the company goes sideways. So, but that's just us, you know, that's the way that we view it. There's a lot of ways and very legitimate ways for, for VCs to examine that component. That's, uh, I, I completely agree with that. Everyone's got a, a feeling on how venture should work. And my feeling is, is like, dude, there's so many different ways to make money in this business. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, I, to I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, Jesse, thank you so much for coming on today. Couple quick questions. What's your favorite book? Ooh, you want a boring book or an exciting book? Uh, yeah, don't see. say anything. Let me give you. Dumb. <laughs> you know, there's this book that I just read um, called The Comfort Crisis. And it is probably one of my all time favorites. It's amazing. It basically examines society today compared to society, say, 100 years ago and the discomforts that we don't experience anymore. Everything from having regular meals all the time to never being emotionally you know, um, discomforted to um, you know, examining um, like our own ability to experience something like death. Like we just, we don't, we don't see this stuff anymore. Like when people die, yeah. we expect them to die because they're 85. Like we don't lose children anymore. Like, we, like none right. of this stuff. And so 
we, we tend now today as a society make mountains out of molehills of problems because we don't experience any other problems. And so the whole notion behind this is like to go and anchor your mental, you know, like your mentality by doing something extraordinarily difficult every year that you only have a 50% chance of actually being able to complete. So when you come out of it, you have some real perspective for how good the rest of your life is. And it totally changed the way that I, that I look at, you know, teaching my kids and all kinds of stuff. It's amazing. So what are you going to, what are you going to do? Well, I've already been in Ironmans and stuff for like five or six years, but it's like the premise is like, you shouldn't go train for it. Like I can go train for an Ironman and like complete the Ironman. But the notion that this says is like, yeah, don't train for it. Just show up and see if you can finish the race and just suffer like crazy. <laughs> right, right, and right. Yeah. Put yourself through intentional <laughs> you know? suffering, right? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like, it's it's really incredible book. So that's like on a personal level, I love that book. You know, on a, a business level, uh, The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz is probably the best, still the best um, venture and founder focused book that I've ever read. I've read it five times and it gets into the human side and the emotional side of the ups and downs of business. And it's very realistic and I, I just love it. It's great. It's great. And so how can, uh, how can people reach out to you, Jesse? How can they get on your wait list? How can they ask you questions? How can they, you know, show your de their deal to your team? Yeah. So, uh, the wait list, you know, sweaterventures.com and you can jump on the wait list. Uh, this is one of those areas where we have to be very careful with the language we use. You can join the wait list to learn more. <laughs> That's yeah, what we very right. specifically say, sure. um, you know, so they, they can be a part of the community that way. Um, I'm personally very, active on LinkedIn. It's easy to find me on LinkedIn or Jesse, just like Google Jesse Randall sweater LinkedIn and I'll pop right up. I'm very active there. I try to be responsive on my DMs. Uh, if you mention this podcast, I'll make sure that I respond and don't. <laughs> Sometimes mm -hmm. I get kind of overwhelmed with the number of DMs coming in. And then like on our deal team, that's probably the best way to get a hold of us too. Um, eventually we will have a deal portal uh, on the website after we launch. But if you are a founder or if you are an investor that has an interesting opportunity you want sweater to see, you'll be able to go through that portal. Awesome. Awesome. Everybody, that is the Capital Stack. Thank you for joining in where we talk to entrepreneurs, founders, operators, and all things value creation and tech. This is Jesse Randall, the CEO and founder of Sweater. Uh, so when are you get sweater.com? Oh, that is an ongoing conversation as we speak. You Not know, cheap, I know the, my friend. Yeah, I know, the, I know the best <laughs> domain guy on the planet. He was on my podcast. The oh, guy, nice. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, the guy that bought uh, Tough to Needles, TN.com. And he's like, oh, this, yeah. He, like, literally, like he spent 20 minutes of the podcast, like completely geeking out about domain names. <laughs> I love it. So we ended up finding the actual owners of it. We're not going through a broker. These guys, they're like a brand aggregator. And uh, sorry, I don't know if you're still recording or not, but they're like a, they're like a brand aggregator. So they own like, um, Oh, what are some of their brands? They own like Spider, like the out, out, like outdoor company, sure. like outerwear company. They own uh, Eddie Bauer. They own um, uh, Reebok. They own a whole bunch of companies like this. And so when they go and acquire the company, they pick up this whole suite of domains that the companies own. And in one of these acquisitions, they part of what came with it was sweater.com. And they've just been sitting on it for like eight years. There's not even wow. like a, a waiting thing or anything. But I mean, they know it's valuable. So we're in discussions <laughs> not trying to figure out. Yeah, yeah, trying to figure out how to how to get it off their hands. <laughs> that's that's going to be a monster domain if you can get that one. Yeah, uh, working on it. All right. Once again, everybody, thank you for turning tuning in. Uh, we drop a podcast every Tuesday. Uh, if you like it, please share it, write a review, or you can find us subscribe at any of iTunes or you know Spotify. Just search my name, David Paul, or look for the Capital Stack. Thank you, everybody, and we'll talk to you next week. Bye bye.